All right, welcome, welcome everybody. Welcome to Consultants Table. I'm Tony Hall from Navigator Consulting. Thank you very much for being here today. Um, we have a very exciting Consultants Table ready for you. Adele Last, our regular presenter, is a, a trainer. She's a former recruitment manager, former recruiter, and as always, she has packed a huge amount of information for you today into Consultants Table. She's talking about forensic market mapping, which is absolutely critical for the current state of the market for anyone looking to expand their business to diversify um, both their client base and their candidate base. Adele, over to you and thank you very much for joining us. Lovely, thanks very much, Tony. I'll just check that everyone can hear me clearly. Just give me a thumbs up. Um, and if you can see on your screen, my presentation with the title Forensic Market Mapping, you can see that as well. Excellent, fantastic. Just a quick check of all of that. Otherwise I launch in and not everyone can see. So thanks very much everyone for joining us today. Thank you for spending some of your afternoon with us. Um, Tony's right, I do try to jam pack as much information as I can into these sessions. Um, when we've been doing these sessions um, in, live in the same room, they run for about an hour and a half. I've been trying to condense this down to an hour because I know that's a long time on video. Um, and I think I've managed to do that today and allow some extra time for questions and comments. And um, as many of you who have been here before will know that that's a really valuable part um, of attending these events is uh, the connection to the network as well. So I do want to try and leave a bit of time for that. But feel free to pop your questions in the chat. Um, I can see that. Tony will, um, can see that as well. Um, if I can get to the question as we're, tr as we're tracking, I will do that. Um, if not, I'll address um, questions at the end as well. So welcome everyone. Um, let's get into uh, this session on forensic market mapping. So I just want to um, start by just clarifying, I guess, um, the aim of, of the presentation, who I'm aiming at, um, and it's aimed at recruitment consultants, uh, billing managers, team leaders, um, there are some owners on the call, senior managers, that sort of thing as well. So anyone in a um, experienced recruitment capacity um, of a senior level, um, often people with a managerial kind of uh, responsibility as well are those on the call. So just um, to make sure that, that, you know, I guess I'm pitching it and that's the level I'm pitching it at. Um, who am I? As Tony said, my name is Adele Last. I have a business called Career Lasso. I have been in the recruitment industry as a recruiter. Um, Tony calls me a former recruiter. I still say I am one. I don't think you can ever lose it. Um, I am uh, still a recruiter and I uh, have managed a number of recruitment businesses across a range of sectors as well. So I have worked blue collar, white collar, I have worked IT, I have worked safety, I've worked permanent, I've worked temp consult, uh, contracting, all sorts of recruitment in my career. So I think I bring a broad range of knowledge um, around that and that's what some of what I'm sharing today. This specific topic I'm talking about, I guess, in two frames. And I'm just interested in a, a show of hands um, when those of you who registered, if you registered to try and look at mapping your existing market, I just want you to give me an indication if it's your existing market or if you're looking to forge to a new market outside of what is perhaps traditional. So Neetha's saying yes to the new market, yeah? Um, anyone doing existing market as well? I've covered both, so might be a mix of both. Looks like a lot of you are doing new ones, which is good. So, and obviously in the current climate, we have to be uh, diverse, you know, diversify in that sense. So as I said, I've covered both of those scenarios here, whether you're looking at um, trying to further explore your existing speciality or whether you are trying to forge into a new area I've covered both of those all right moving along I just want to start with a, a few definitions because I think this is worth understanding um, where this term comes from and where the concept actually comes from um, and technically it is a marketing definition or a marketing concept and the marketing definition of it is um, a study of market conditions so this is market mapping as a term um, a study of market conditions plotted on a map to identify trends corresponding variables between consumers and products helps locate problem areas figure out the source of problems and examining related variables so it makes sense in a marketing you know when you say marketing map or a map the market in a marketing sense it's about looking at you know where your customers are who's using your product and why they're using it that's what it's about but it definitely applies in the recruitment sense as well and we have a slightly different 
frame for it as you would know. From an internal recruitment perspective, though, it does have a different meaning as we would know. So market mapping, if you're an internal recruiter, is about assessing the talent within an organisation. So mapping out what you already have, looking at where the skills gaps are, and then trying to um, make sure you can close those skills gaps on a regular basis, you know, attracting that kind of talent to the organisation. And it's usually when there aren't any roles on. So it's usually before the skill is needed um, in the internal sense. Um, but we are agency recruiters on this call um, and the recruitment definition is actually really simple. It kind of just falls into two areas, I suppose. Um, there is client mapping and there is candidate mapping. And you can do both of them um, alongside each other um, and you will use different tools in each of them for different purposes of why you're mapping. So generally speaking, the candidate mapping side is utilised more when you are trying to make sure you have exhausted and explored your existing market. It could be about expanding your existing market, but you're expanding it from the candidate perspective of using the candidate um, uh, information and candidate value proposition. And the client market mapping is usually the traditional one we're probably more com uh, familiar with in terms of mapping a new market, mapping to find clients in a market. So either of them are um, valuable in recruitment. We're going to cover both of those today. So um, can we're going to start with candidate mapping first. So I want to use an analogy here because we are talking about mapping and I want to use that analogy in terms of um, likening it to a map. And there are certain um, points on a map or, or key, um, key figures that, that stand out on a map that most of us are familiar with. And I've translated that to, to what we're going to do today. So a map has a title. And if you think about the title on a map, that's the area of specialisation. That's the market. That is you saying, I want to get into IT um, recruitment or I want to specialise in cyber security or whatever it may be. Um, if you look on a map, there are masses of land. These are usually obstacles or things to avoid, um, but certainly to keep your eye on. So anyone who out there um, on the call who is a sailor will understand what I'm saying in terms of keeping your eye always on land. You know, even when you're far away from it, you're still watching um, your proximity to land. So that's on a map, you know, you're looking at land masses and navigating your way through. Um, and things to avoid in the business sense. Um, a navigation chart is where you plan to travel. So that little map in the background there has got a map, you know, a chart around the world there. Um, your navigation chart is a bit like your business plan of what, you know, title is my specialisation, but what am I planning to do with it? How am I going to go about this? That's sort of your how. Um, the ports where you might stop along the way or your milestones that you'll reach as you, as you work through it. Um, the weather is the unknown, as it would be for any sailor, as it is for any business person as well, and for any consultant working in this space. Um, it's the unknown, it's the market fluctuations, it's COVID, um, it's all of the things that many of us are, are feeling right now and have um, in regular cycles throughout our careers. That's the unknown. Um, and to circumnavigate something is about going all the way around it. Um, and stating your claim and owning the land. And I want to use that analogy today for market mapping in a business sense, because that's what you need to do. You need to have this holistic approach where you're going all the way around something, um, looking at it from very all different angles, and then stating claim on it, saying this is the specialisation, this is the area that I wish to work in. You can't claim land um, if you just you know, if you just traverse one coast, you can't just go on one side of it and say, okay, yep, yeah, I like the look of this. I'm going to call this, this, uh, my land. Um, you know, when, when people were, um, exploring and, um, making sure that they, uh, sorry, someone was saying, make sure your microphone's muted. Th muted. Thanks, Tony. Um, yeah, please feel free to turn your cameras on, but if you can mute your microphone. So yeah, you need to, um, have gone and circumnavigated completely in order to claim land. So that's my little um, sailing analogies to this and, and my map analogy. Um, I'm going to get on, as I said, to the candidate side to start with. And I've got this um, grid here, which is a bit of a, a, you know, it's a map in itself. And if you would like copies of the presentation today, um, I believe Tony's going to provide that. If you'd like to contact me directly, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, um, just as Adele last, and I'll be happy to send this through to you. But this can be a really great... Um, starting point of working out the information you need to collect. And I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to literally sit down and create this grid with these headings and start to work through this. So candidate mapping is about identifying, like the marketing definition explained to us, you know, who the customer is and what do they look like. It's, it's real demographic studies in terms of understanding 
who is the candidate. And we start from a perfect position. We start from the ideal candidate. So we create a bio of that candidate. So what is their persona? What is likely to be their age, their position, their title, their salary, location? You need to know these things about the perfect candidate, about the ideal candidate before you can get started. So if you haven't got this information, this is going to tell you where you need to do more research um, or you need to find out more information about it. So you should be creating a persona. It might be built from an existing candidate. That's the easiest place to start. So if you come across a great candidate in the space that you want to break into, um, then I would be using that candidate's background and profile to start this. I would be I'd be using them as the as the template and looking for similar candidates to that. So you want to start with this bio. But you want to delve further than just that. I think a lot of us have possibly done that. We possibly do that um, ad hoc. We possibly kind of go, well, I've got a profile of what I'm looking for and I'm going to keep looking. But this is quite forensic in its, in its detail if you have a look through. So you actually want to understand the reasons to change jobs. And I'm talking about deep motivation reasons here. The goals in life, what are they actually trying to achieve here? And that requires a really in-depth conversation. So in order to get this sort of information, you are going to need to do that research and explore, maybe with several candidates, maybe a cross-section of candidates from that space. Um, but you really need to understand about their reasons to change jobs. That's obviously in recruitment one of the most important factors in understanding how we're going to attract people. Working across the top of this, um, you need to look at their job search behaviour. So how do they look for jobs? Is it a reasonably active um, job market? Is it a passive job market? So in um, environments where candidates are short, it's usually reasonably passive, as we know. Where there's an abundance of candidates or there's been a flood to the market of candidates, um, they're considered active candidates. So you need to understand those behaviours in the market that you're trying to map. Um, are they applying via mobile? Are they applying via desktop? Um, are they getting referred by family and friends? Some of this data you can collect through analytics in the back end of your websites, from job board sites, um, even from Google Analytics. If you haven't got that set up, make sure that's set up for you so you can start to see how people are being attracted to your site. Post an ad, see what kind of response you get and where they're coming from and what kind of applications they're making. You need to really understand the person's personality. Um, you know, what are their main traits? Um, things that a psychometric analysis would show, but you're not necessarily going to do a psychometric test. You might do. I guess if you have um, access to a reasonably priced product, you might try and do um, a couple of psychometric profiles on these ideal candidates or on the ideal candidate to get a bit of a persona around what that personality is like. But personality is pretty individual, as we know. So you're not necessarily going to focus on everyone having the same personality, but what are the common traits of a personality type of someone in that industry? So there are some that we make assumptions of around very technical, um, very compliance driven um, environments or roles where we assume that the people that are successful in those roles have that kind of mindset. They have the mindset of following things to the letter and, and not bending the rules. Is that, is that what is successful in that industry? That's what you're trying to determine. You're trying to break some of your um, assumptions, stereotypes here, some of even your unconscious bias. You want, to, you want to get that out of the way and be really open to what it is the, the information is presenting to you. Moving along to the next box on the far right side is motivation. Um, and this comes back a little bit to the goals element. The goals is broader. As I said, it could be life goals and work goals in there together. Um, this one's more about what are they looking for in the role that they go into and the organisation. So what is the firm's reputation, the company's reputation, their mission, their values, um, organisational culture, what benefits pay? Obviously, we need to know those. Uh, projects and innovations they're interested in, the work environment, learning and education, how important is that? How important is the people that they work with? So again, this is information you want to collate from the candidate, from that ideal candidate of what are the kinds of organisations that appeal to them. And they may be ones that they've worked in that they say, well, this was the best organisation I've worked in because of this reason. Or they may be ones they aspire to. Look, I'd really want to work, you know, um, at Google because they have this reputation of, um, you know, launching great pro projects every three months. And that's something I'm really interested in. So you really need to understand the, the company motivation for them, um, the value proposition within the organisation that's important to them. 
Um, the bottom line now, we look at their frustrations as well. So what frustrates them? Um, why do they want to change jobs? What barriers to change um, have they had? Um, have they found that the industry is, is not moving at the same pace that they are wishing to? Um, you know, you need to understand if there are any frustrations, either in their job search or throughout their career. Um, the channels of where they look for jobs, obviously this one's really critical and any marketer will tell you this. You first need to identify who your customer is, who am I trying to reach and where will I reach them? How will I, what is the best way to get my product, in our case our service, you know, to the market? How are we going to reach candidates that, that look like this perfect candidate that we want to get in touch with? So are they on social media? Are they more likely to be a referral? Are they on job boards, career sites, um, on other work sites, you know? Um, I know, you know, in the nursing space, you know, uh, great recruitment occurs, you know, on shift in hospitals um, for those of you in that space as well. So, you know, looking at those channels of where am I likely to be able to access um, this ideal candidate? Obviously, looking at their skills is important, their primary skills and attributes, um, the areas in which they have the most knowledge and experience. You need to be really narrow with this one. Um, this is where a lot of people, I think, collect too much data. So they try to keep it too broad and, and have a very wide range of skills for the ideal candidate. And that may be hard to do because you might be trying to work in a whole sector, um, not just in a couple of roles. I'll come back to that in a minute, though. That's some advice I give a bit later is to perhaps narrow it down because in any one sector, you know, there might be, say, 20 different types of positions you could recruit for. And that's probably being conservative. Um, but you really need to narrow down these primary skills so that you can really focus and target your message really accurately. So... This is, as I said, a great starting point um, as a candidate map mapping tool. Um, I would use those headings. You can literally just copy that straight out um, it, when you get a copy of the presentation. But hopefully you can see how much more detail you need to collect than perhaps what we've done before. In terms of sourcing it, I've mentioned before that you would most likely um, gain a lot of this information from an interview, but you can imagine that that's a very different interview for some of you than, than we're currently having, which in a lot of cases is a bit more of, an, a, a, bit more of a chat, a bit more of a casual conversation. Um, and um, we did a session last month about um, uh, advanced interview techniques. And those of you that were in that session will recall we spoke about these deep dive questioning, these deep dive interviews that actually give you a lot more information than we're perhaps used to asking. And we sometimes feel a bit fearful to ask. I don't know, maybe fear is not the right word. We're probably a bit reluctant, you know, to feel like we're, we're too um, intrusive, too pushy. We want to keep it very job related. But you can see some of those questions um, on that previous slide are pretty personal. They're very much about someone's internal reasoning and motivation. So, um, so the interview is obviously going to be the greatest source, but you might need to do that um, at a different level, at a deeper level, maybe over several conversations. Maybe it's one initial phone interview and then it moves um, through to further phone conversations to gather that sort of information. And I do suggest that you talk to the candidate about, you know, what you are collecting and why. Um, you're more likely to get um, greater, um, greater um, participation um, from them in that case, um, in terms of being able to, um, you know, get an undercover, uncover um, the information that you need. Um, you could also survey. Obviously, that's a really um, obvious one to do um, is to survey a group of candidates, um, survey a large group of candidates um, and sort through the data. Sometimes a large group of candidates will give you a very bland um, data set, though. Be aware of that because you're going to have huge variation. Um, so sometimes, um, again, being narrow and looking at candidates that you know um, fits some of those ideal traits and just serving a smaller group is going to give you a more pointed response, which is what you need for this. So this isn't about trying to get a large, um, uh, you know, section of cross section. Um, this is about trying to get very accurate information. But a survey can be a really good way um, of making sure the questions are consistent as well. So if you've got multiple people doing this, um, that could be a good way to make sure that the questions are consistent. Um, certainly brainstorming it um, within your organisation um, is a really great idea. So, you know, bring up that chart and work through that yourselves and, and try and answer those questions yourselves with most of the, the mark knowledge that you might already have as a team and then see where the gaps are and then that's where you need to go and survey or that's where you need to go um, and ask for more information from a candidate. So um, brainstorming can be a great way to collectively work out what you do know. Pardon me. Uh, <coughs> oh, pardon me. Sorry. Sneezing. Um, 
uh, client talent is another source as well. So um, again, you might be looking at getting into or looking at a sector that is just kind of left of where you sit now. It might be in a similar vein and you might have clients in that space who you can already talk to and they might already have great talent in that space um, or they may have a key person in that role that you're wanting to branch into. So you may be able to talk to this in client and say, listen, I'm, I'm working on a, um, um, a new product service line. I'm going into that market. I know that you have, um, you know, a cyber security expert I wondered if I might speak to that person if I might have some time with them just to ask them some questions about what they know about the market and you want to profile that person and ask them those sorts of detailed questions to give you that that information so if you've got client talent you could tap into absolutely do that um, and then sort of collective knowledge. I mean, you actually have a much bigger network um, than you realise. You know, this is a network. Tony's group is a network in itself. Many of you are in non-competing spaces and have information. Um, sorry, does someone have a question then? No? <laughs> if you've joined us and you've got your sound on, please mute yourself um, just to keep the sound down um, for everyone. Lovely. Um, and yeah, so collective knowledge. Think about your greater network. Think about people you can ask um, that even aren't in recruitment, outside of recruitment in your business network or inside recruitment in these kind of networks in non-competing agencies um, who might be able to have information, even if they're not in the space that you want to work in. You'd be surprised how many people know people and we all know that, right? So, you know, I'm wanting to get go and start a nursing agency and I'm going to go and ask my, my um, colleague over here who runs a blue collar agency but it just so happens he used to work at, at, a, at a nursing agency prior to that and he's got a whole lot of knowledge he's willing to share. So um, so just think about that collective knowledge of, of your greater network as well um, to get that information. In terms of using um, the candidate persona um, and there's a little you know um, infographic there where you might set up this kind of profile which you know which is not a bad idea it's quite visual for people to get a quick glance um, if you've got other consultants working with you on this to, for all of you to have a quick glance at the different types of people and kind of even categorize them to create a little profile like marketing Mary over there but in using this information um, you're obviously using it to identify um, top talent you're creating a benchmark you're creating a yardstick in which to compare other candidates to that's initially its its main purpose and it also helps to identify um, where the best are or who are the best so there's a benchmarking exercise to this to be able to say um, I'm going to not only find out the types of people, skills, persona, motivations of people in this space, I'm then going to rank them. I'm going to benchmark them against each other. I'm going to benchmark them against global standards or, or um, Australian standards or regional standards. Um, and that provides some really valuable data for you and really for the client in that space as well, if you think about it. Um, if you can talk about um, no, you know, knowing what are the, the required uh, qualifications, let's say, for a particular industry in a particular space. Um, you know, there may be a qualification that everybody's really pushing for and you may find an alternative qualification that is as valuable and as useful um, through your benchmarking exercises. So um, definitely encourage you to do that. Um, obviously, you'll use it to drive attraction strategies. That's a given. You're going to look at where are these people um, uh, registering? Where are they looking? Um, what are they doing? What are some of those habits, the online business habitual habits that you can tap into? Where could you be advertised to put things in front of them? So driving those attraction strategies um, in the right areas. And as we know, um, you know, it's it's not the spend that you have in that space. It's, it's how you choose to spend that sort of money in the right areas. Um, so driving attraction strategies. You could also use this information to train your newbies or to train other consumers consultants. So often what happens is when you do particularly a candidate mapping exercise, the knowledge actually all sits often with one person in the organisation. If any of you have had this happen, where someone has built up this wealth of knowledge about an industry, a market, a candidate um, profile, um, and then they leave. Um, or, you know, um, the information isn't shared. Um, and so by having these kind of maps, having these profiles um, outlined like that, that um, graphic there, you could use that to train new people to your organisation or others in your organisation as they come in so that the information is shared and also then the collective um, the collection of data is shared as well. So more of you out there looking for what's needed, even if they're working in another space. So I encourage you to, to make sure you communicate 
to your existing teams um, about the new space that you're wanting to forge into or about doing this project because your other consultants who are working in other areas are still a great source of information, as we know, for the area you want to work in. They come across candidates, they hear things on the grapevine, they're talking to clients that might be suitable. So you definitely want to use the opportunity to, to uh, transfer the knowledge um, across the business where you can. Um, you can segment the candidate market much better once you've got candidate personas. I think what we tend to do um, often is we kind of group candidates um, very simplistically sometimes things like you know qualified and unqualified or you know less than five years experience and more than five years. we use really arbitrary um qualifiers of candidates and this allows you to segment it um in a much more sophisticated fashion as you could see um you you'll be looking at um at things that actually matter to them being able to get the job around things like the motivations and the goals um training opportunities all those kind of things so this market segmentation is is much deeper um, when you have the candidate persona created. Um, you can write targeted copy as well once you have this information. So again, good marketing advice will tell you, you wanna find out who, you, who your target is, you wanna find out where to, uh, um, to talk to them, where to speak to them. And then the final thing is you find out what to say. You gotta be able to speak that language. Um, and good ad writers know this. So those of you out there that write great great advertising job adverts um, and you attract those great candidates. So you get candidates that say, oh, this ad was speaking to me, means that you really targeted that well, means that your ad hit the right mark. And the same needs to happen here. But how will you do that unless you really understand um, what the candidate is looking for? And I'm not just talking job ads there in terms of copy. I'm talking about blogging. Um, I'm talking about articles. I'm talking about posts. I'm talking about your website. Even a language on your website should be able to speak to this perfect candidate persona that you are trying to attract. Um, marketing initiatives as well. So obviously you would use it to drive other marketing initiatives in relation to things that you do in your business, whether that's events, whether that's giveaways, special offers, um, whatever the marketing activity is that you have on your marketing plan or sales plan um, should also touch point back to your candidate persona uh, to make sure that it's relevant and make sure it will attract um, that person. And if you're not sure, you know, come up with that concept and run it past that target candidate. If you've got that, that model candidate to run it past, um, you know, put that plan in front of them and say, can I just run this past you? Is this where you would look? Is this the kind of advert? Is this the kind of article you would read? Okay, in terms of uncovering the talent, in terms of, of you know, really finding um, out um, where they are and how to access them, um, I've put some information here that will help in that space. So you need to look um, in two main areas, influencers. So who influences their decision? Is it family, friends, partners, current employers, colleagues, HR managers, recruiters, CEOs, future employee or future colleagues? So you really need to understand a little bit about the industry they're working in here to understand who are those major influencers um, in their own industry and obviously without without saying you need to be following them those people you need to be making sure you're tapping into that market of influencers um, sitting alongside the influencers who they trust will you know, envelop you in that blanket as well so um, really understanding um, those influence elements and don't be too logical sometimes with this sometimes it's some some things you may not have thought of so it may not be the obvious um, you know speakers that are that are touting their wares all the time and um, it could, there could be other elements um, to, to what they're interested in or what they're looking at. So look at geographical things in that space as well. Sometimes um, markets and, and, and um, yeah, markets that you're in are influenced by, um, by the geography um, and then what in that geography culturally is what people do. So start to, again, think about putting yourself living in the shoes of that person. What do they look like? What do they do? Where do they go? Where do they hang out? Who are they talking to? Um, and then content um, and resources, obviously, is another area. So um, whose information is it that they'll trust? Are they looking at job boards, um, social media posts, corporate sites, career sites, um, current employers and leaders? Um, what's missing from there is associations. So what associations are they members of and where are they looking for their information there? Um, talent networking events, that sort of thing as well. So um, I just put some other reminders on the bottom of this slide. Um, 
just to remind you about SEO on the job ads. I don't know how many of you um, are doing this. I don't know if you remember when SEO first started and it was a really big thing, you know, probably about 10 years ago, um, everybody was talking about um, the SEO that you needed on your job ads. And we've sort of forgotten about that, I think. We focus very much on our website for certain. We absolutely make sure that our website either has somebody with SEO you know, knowledge um, swipe their eye over it. Some of us are paying SEO experts to do that. Some of us just, just know uh, that you've got to have as many keywords um, in your, about the sector in your website. That's kind of what everybody knows. I'm not sure we do so much of that in job ads anymore. I think we've lost um, that focus. And your job ad, if you think about it, is a piece of advertising that's happening far more regularly than your website. It's going out to the market more often than anything else you do, unless you're a pro prolific blogger and post If you're posting three, two or three times a week, then you know, possibly you're on par with, with what people are seeing in terms of seeing your ads. But for most people, your advertising, your job advertising, is going out and reaching the market much more frequently than you ever will. So think about that as an advert. Obviously, you don't want to put your, your sales pitch of your company in there. It's got to be about the job. I understand that. But be clever about your keywords in that advertising because Google and other search engines are using that all the time and that's bringing you much further and further to the top of searches. So just a reminder there about your job ads, SEO job ads. Um, Blogging is my next one. So video blogging um, is a combi is, is that combination of those words. Um, far more powerful now than any blog you will write. For those of you that are already using video will know this. Um, when you create a video, it has uh, greater reach, greater traction, um, more, um, more uh, connection, engagement than anything you could actually write. Um, and that's why you'll notice some people have now even started to put how long, when they post an article, they say how long the read is. Have you seen that now? Um, you know, so on the bottom, it'll have an article and it'll say two minute read um, or three minute read. They're like saying, you know, we know you don't want to read it, but it's only two minutes, right? So on a video, we're so used to opening the video, the little arrows there, we can see in the bottom corner, okay, this is going to be a one minute 49 video. Yeah, I'm going to watch that. So video is far more powerful powerful um, than, than written um, at the moment. Um, algorithms may change on that again, but if you're not um, blogging, then absolutely that needs to be on your to-do list this week. Get out there and, and video yourself. Don't worry so much about um, the self-conscious. In fact, some of those ones that are really natural and authentic are some of the best videos that people see. Um, uh, the online community um, hub is another way of making sure that um, the information that you're putting out there is being seen by the right people. So that could be about if you've got uh, some people in the industry you're wanting to break into, asking them whether they will like and comment and post, uh, like and comment and share your posts, um, because that will then increase the reach um, of, of people that uh, see it as well. So I don't know if any of you are using um, a marketing hub. A marketing hub is actually a group of people that get together from non-competing organisations and agree um, that every time one of them posts anything in a group, they all like and comment and post. And the, and the idea is that it actually forces the, the, algorithm, the algorithms to notice your posts and then put them in, more, in front of more of the right people. So there, there are these little online community hubs you can create. Um, I'm not aware of any in recruitment actually, so um, if anyone's interested in talking to me about that, I might be the first one to create, or if there is one, let me know. I'd love to know about it. But um, where we could be all helping each other um, actually bring this information to the top. It's competing, yes, but not really if, if we're trying to attract the right candidates here um, into a particular sector. You're not really competing. Um, graduates and trainers um, is another source um, of looking for this kind of talent um, when you're trying to map, you know, you've got your persona and then where am I going to, to put the message in front of people? Um, I don't, I want to remind you of thinking about this as a long-term marathon and not a sprint. Whilst we're in pain right now, we want to gain some quick wins and we want to get back on our feet quickly. If you're thinking about forging into a new market, it is absolutely a marathon. You've got to think the long range. So you need to be going back and looking at graduates and the trainers of people who are doing courses in the space you 
you want to work in and um, forging those relationships early in the piece. Obviously, it is long range because graduate coming out might not be somebody you'd be able to recruit maybe for four or five years, um, or but it may be sooner and they may know other people um, or the industry might shift and, and look at, at friends with less experience. So don't underestimate the grad market in any market you're mapping. Um, and grads are fantastic sources of information as well. So um, I would definitely make sure you tap into that. Obviously, they're very um, digital native and so they could also be part of that community hub to help you um, gain some traction um, in the space. Um, and LinkedIn searches as well. And I'm not um, advocating paid LinkedIn products here. I'm talking about free, uh, unpaid, um, regular searches on LinkedIn. I know there's limits to it. I know you will get blocked not blocked, but you'll get cut off at a certain number of connections. You have to wait a day till it kind of resets and go again. It's slow going in that sense. But again, if it's a long-term plan for you, you are able to do this without any costs on LinkedIn in terms of connecting with people that are the types of profiles that you're trying to um, try to try to try to, type of candidates and clients you're trying to connect with. All right, moving on. Um, the final part of the, the candidate mapping side of it is um, advice is to be collector. Um, I found a photo of stamp collecting there. I was like, I don't know anyone that um, collects stamps anymore. It's like a really rare skill. Um, when I was a kid, I was a, a stamp collector, but I thought that was a cool photo. Um, for those of you that are too young, you'll be going, what the hell is she talking about? Why are people collecting stamps? Um, but be a collector. And what I mean by that is be a collector of people. Um, so you want to avoid in, in candidate mapping and trying to attract candidates in the market. You want to avoid being seen to be that direct headhunting. As most of you know, um, that very rarely works um, in getting the outcome that you need. Sometimes we're doing that. Sometimes we're absolutely finding a candidate we need for a job. We're going in hard going, hey, I'd like to talk to you. I've got a client who has your skills. Are you interested? We absolutely do that, I know. But it is much more powerful if it's somebody who's in your network, who's been following you for a little while, who's heard your name and understands what you do. Um, you make a reach out at a time that's appropriate and then you draw them in. Your success rate is greatly increased in that model. They're just going in hard um, as a headhunter or as a, you know, as a direct approach. You also, as you would all know, those of you that have done um, headhunting, um, it, it makes the outcome much harder um, in terms of appro directly approaching somebody. Their expectations are in, in the ceiling, you know. Um, they expect uh, amazing conditions at a huge pay, um, you know, for very little work because you've made the approach to them. So you, it, it's a much harder proposition to make to them. So I think if you do the consistent effort of collecting people along the way, even when there's no jobs on, um, when you need to make the approach, it's going to be much easier for you. Um, I'm talking 10 minutes a day. I don't know how many of you are spending time regularly. So I know most of you on this call are probably um, pretty good on LinkedIn, pretty good on your, on your blogs or your vlogs, pretty good at trying to raise your profile and be seen and understand it. And those of you who aren't doing it, understand the importance of it. I'm not trying to sell that to you. But how many of you are doing it consistently? How many of you are doing it? I'm saying 10 minutes a day. So all you need to do is set aside 10 minutes a day. That could be, you know, the 10 minutes while you, um, you know, while you do something else that, that, you know, just relax after dinner and sit down in front of the TV. Grab your phone, grab your iPad and do that 10 minutes of active, connecting, branching out, doing the marketing, um, uh, planning, mapping that you need to do. If you just take 10 minutes a day, the consistency of effort is actually what turns the result better than anything else. So any one of these tips that I'm giving you today aren't good on their own unless you're going to put that into a program and do it consistently. Um, and look at strategic referrals and introductions that always be a much better way, as we know, um, to get introduced to somebody. So always ask someone if, uh, and LinkedIn's great at that, you know, it shows up people that you know that know that person. Ask for the introduction. They can only say no. Nine times out of 10 people say yes. Um, even, um, even draft an email, draft a little message that they can send to so say, hey, I see we have a connection in common. I wonder if you could introduce me to them. Here's a little board that might help. And they often do this copy and paste it and, and, you know, connect the two of you in that way. And that's a much softer way to get that intro. So I encourage you to collect people now, um, which you already do as recruiters, but be really strategic about it and commit to at least 10 minutes a day. Some of you will be doing more than that now, um, which is great. But again, I encourage you to do it consistently. 
Um, you need to understand what candidates um, will do to move. Um, and I'll just cover this one off quickly because we know about this as recruiters. Uh, you know, there's four Bs there. They'll move for brands. So companies that want to work for them with the benefits. So things the company offers, they'll move for their back pocket, talk about pay, and they'll move for betterment. Um, a betterment, I mean um, development. I mean making them a better employee than when they went in. So, so changed and evolved um, and bettered um, by that experience in that organisation. They're some of the key motivators that people want um, and you need to understand which ones you're talking to in the market that you want to, to forge into. Um, so know the key motivators for the industry. And you really could consult to clients on this. You know, this sort of information we have, I don't know if we realise how powerful this actually is. If you could tell your clients um, through a survey or through this market mapping that you're doing, through um, the candidate personas that you've created, um, what, your, what the candidate's in that industry actually want and what they're motivating moving for and, and how often they're doing that that's really powerful information and most of you have that and i don't know that we share it as much as we should so think about a video that talks about that think about writing a post if you want to write one think about how you could share that information with your client so that that you become that expert in their own industry um, on knowledge that they can't ordinarily access all right, now I'm moving on to client mapping. Um, as I said, these kind of cross over. There's not, there's not a massive difference. I mean, the candidate one, we're focusing on individuals. These include organisations as well. Um, but you would use both of these skill sets um, depending on what, what your target was about. But um, you need to know where you want to go and why. And I borrowed... Um, our um, opening image on our invitation for this one because I thought that was really cool um, that this guy is, you know, really looking out into the horizon. Where am I going? But more importantly, why? And I want to really make you stop and think about this. All of you joined and, and joined this uh, um, seminar, this, this webinar today, um, because you had in the back of your mind, you have been wanting to forge into that market or have been trying, or I, I think that's an area I want to go in, or I think we need to diversify. Whatever your motivation was, I really want you to stop and ask yourself why you're doing it in relation to that particular industry. Because it's really important to have have an important why. If it is just, I see a lot of whole lot of money being made over there, that could be your motivation. Um, but, I'll, but I'll warn you against that because it, it's that shiny things syndrome, right? So things look shiny from far away. And often when we get up close, they're not quite as shiny as they look. And there's a lot of hard work to get there. So make sure your why um, is a deep-seated, um, you know, purposeful reason that means something to you. Oh, sorry, I'm going to sneeze again. <laughs> Pardon me. So know your why of what, why you really want to do. It's really important. Um, we want you want to do an industry review as a starting point on um, a client mapping exercise. Um, you need to understand where you're positioned now. If it's a new market, you're you're positioned. Pardon me. You're positioned at ground zero. You're, you have no market um, uh, share if you haven't worked in this space before. But often um, we forge into new markets where we've, had, we've dipped our toe, we've had a little bit of expertise or a client has referred us off to another industry and we've done a little bit of work there. We have some knowledge there. So work out exactly how much you have of the market or how, where you're positioned. So, um, yeah, how much of the market do you have? Um, what is the market size and spend? How big is the market you're trying to get into and what do they spend on recruitment services? They're questions you need to know the answers to. You need to get this information. I'm going to talk about some of the places you can get that. Um, who are the top five players in the market? And players, I mean, within their own industry, so not your competitors. Who are the top five uh, companies in the market you're trying to get into? And are you working with any of them? Who are the top five on size, turnover, industry reputation, whatever it might be, however you want to grade them, what are the top five? And, and have you got any connection to any of those top five? Because that's really kind of where you want to start. Um, you want to focus on that top end. There'll be lots of stuff in the middle. Um, you don't want to focus on, um, you know, right at the bottom end. And sometimes that's where we start. We get a little bite from something that might be near the bottom end of that market, but aim to the top. Um, 
do a stock take, do a stock take of what you've got. What do I know? Um, what have I got? Have I got any candidates already in this space um, on my database? Chances are you have. Chances are perhaps that's the motivation. That's where you started from. But, um, but make sure you do a full stock take. What exactly have I got? Are they still in the industry? Why did they get out? What do they know? Maybe they could be the start of your, your interview surveying um, to be able to then find, you know, the echelon candidates at the top end. Uh, maybe you're going to start with some that might not be in the space anymore or have dipped their toe in. But do a stock take of of your goods that are available to you in your database. Um, estimation of the competitive market size. So um, this is now looking at your competitors. So who is in that market? Um, that's something I think we do pretty well. We look at a market and we go, uh, who do we know that's in that space? Um, we probably um, do a bit more of an anecdotal review of that. You need to be really accurate about this information. You need to make sure you create a summary of your competitors. So it's a full SWOT analysis um, of where you sit um, against the market and who's in the market and what do you know about your competitors. It isn't just enough to go, these are the competitors and, and this is um, perhaps, you know, how many, how much they've got of the market that I think you really need to understand what their perception of the market is um, to them and, and vice versa. So the market you're trying to get into, what, it, how do they perceive your competitor? And you might need to ask clients that question if you don't know the answer. And don't make it up, you know. We, we tend to kind of go, oh, yeah, we know they don't like them because they're, you know, they're a big multinational. They're not going to deal with them. That may not be true. They may actually love that about them. So don't be um, pig-headed about this. You've got to really get raw and ask the question. Um, you might pay for a report to get this information. So there are marketing organisations that you can pay to, um, to slice and dice the market like this. So um, you, you might want to do that to get some really accurate um, information um, that's usually really up to date. Um, otherwise, you can use tools, um, some tools that are free um, or have a low cost to kind of see where you sit. So there's a website, if any of you have used it or haven't used it, um, called Social Mention. Um, I think it's just .com, not AU, um, social mention. If you type in um, your business, so go to social mention, type in your business, and it'll give you an idea of um, your activity um, in your market. Um, so you could put that in against the competitors and see their activity. What are they posting um, or how are they traveling in that market that you want to be in? So social mention. And the other one is the social selling index, which is on LinkedIn. So if, if um, any of you are not using that, um, that's, uh, it's a free tool that LinkedIn offer, um, which then leads you to want, you know, they want you to buy a paid product from it. But the tool, the free part, you can use anytime you like and as often as you like. Um, if you want that link, um, you know, you reach out to me on LinkedIn, I'll send it to you. Um, it's just a link, you pop it in uh, and it basically gives you a ranking of how your own profile and anyone you put in there, you put all your consultants in one at a time, how your profile um, ranks in your, in your industry. What kind, of, um, what kind of a player are you in the market? Um, and, and it gives you an actual number and you can watch that number fluctuate and it measures all sorts of things. So the posting you're doing, the engagement you're getting, the activities, the responses, who's looking at you, who, who's viewed your profile, all that kind of stuff. So that's a really interesting one if you've never done that on yourself. Um, you can just Google search, I think, Social Selling Index, but there is a particular link to it. So as I said, reach out to me um, and I can send that to you. All right, still keeping on with the client mapping, we need to work out who in some cases. Sometimes the market is so new to us, so we're so blind of where to start, um, we don't actually even know who the client base is. And you need to start with that. You need to understand who is the, great, who is the broadest client base that I need to reach, and then you're gonna target down from there. So you could look at the Australian Stock Exchange directory, um, that has a list and it's free of, of, of all companies that are listed um, on the stock exchange. So, um, and it has information about each company, in fact, um, if you click on it. So you get a full list and then you click on the company, it goes into some detail about them. Um, so check out the ASX directory if you're not using that. Um, in busy markets, um, think about being a disruptor. So again, I often um, speak to business owners who sort of say to me, oh, you know, um, healthcare is going really well at the moment, which is the case, you know, or healthcare is going well over there. Um, you know, I really want a piece of that pie. I want to go over there. And I'm going to get in some of that market. Great. That's a great idea. That's a great reason to want to do it. But don't go and just do what everybody else is doing. If you're going to enter into what is already a busy market that is, is well saturated, you have to disrupt it somehow. 
So you're going to have to offer something that's slightly different to what they're getting from everybody else, because otherwise you're not going to be able to break into what is a busy, well-established market. So you've got to think a little bit differently about, um, yeah, how you're, going to, how you're going to disrupt. Disrupt is the best word for it. So how am I going to get in there by doing something a little different to the competitors that are already in? Um, uh, Ibis, this is Isis World. <laughs> it should be Ibis World. I, I uh, have a typo in there. Sorry about that, guys. So Ibis World um, is an organisation um, that many of you may have used before. They have a great website um, where you can purchase um, information reports about companies, but there's a whole lot of free information on there as well. I don't know when was the last time any of you looked um, at Ibis World. Uh, hang up from today's session and go on there right now if you've not looked at it. That's um, I-B-I-S, um, Ibis World. Um, and, uh, and they have some great, as I said, free information, lists of pages and pages. You can put in an industry. Show me all of the companies in Australia in this industry. Right? It gives you a whole list. It's the best starting point. Um, you've got to slice and dice it down from there, but it's a really great broad start. Um, you could also think about getting a student, a trainee, recruiter, someone new in your organisation or someone with time on their hands at the moment. If they've not got jobs, jobs on, think about having them do a research project. So collecting and collating this data, slicing and dicing it, market segmenting it for you. So starting with that broad information and lo looking at um, who we want to work with and why or who's already on our database. So grab the IBIS world list, cross-reference it to your existing database, who do we already know, um, cross-reference it to your LinkedIn contact contacts, who am I already connected with? So that could be a research project. You could pay a trainee or, or a student um, uh, to do that. I've got trainees, by the way, in my business. I uh, train new recruiters coming into the industry. So if any of you are looking for someone to do that kind of project, I've got some staff that could do that um, at really cheap cost too. So let me know. Uh, that's my plug. Um, org charts and websites um, are a great source of who. Um, obviously, that allows you to kind of quantify and qualify the client a bit better. You'd be surprised how many organisations publish their org charts. Big listed companies, in most cases, will publish their whole org chart, um, often including full names um, of every person and their roles. You know, that is a proper map. That, that's a starting point, especially in a big organisation, where you can say, okay, we're going to work through this systematically. We're going we're gonna to find out who are the key people we need to speak to and cross them off quite literally off an org chart print it off big put it on the wall and cross off contact with each person as you work through it um, you'd be surprised as i said how much information is publicly available um, keep your competition close um, that's really important particularly if you're forging into a market um, where there are competitors lots of them or few of them it doesn't matter find out who the main sort of key players are i would say maybe three to four don't go mad you could go mad following everybody but um, you know the top three uh, players in that market that you're trying to forge into, who are they and watch them closely. Not to copy them, uh, not to steal anything, but you really need to, they're going to give you some really valuable firsthand and in real time data about what's going on. So you need to make sure you're watching, following, connecting, um, you know, uh, if you don't want to do it personally, make it someone in your organisation, make it your partner, somebody, you know, one step away to just keep an eye about what's going on with your competition. Check their website regularly. All of that information you can access without them seeing that you're watching. Um, this is what I made earlier about starting with one or two roles in the market. This is what I think we do as well. We sort of go, I'll use that cyber security um, example at the start of this. So if you wanted to work, start working in the cyber security market, this is the recruitment market nowadays apparently by the way fastest growing cyber security so you want to now recruit cyber security experts within a cyber security space there's probably about five different roles um, you know there's probably lots of sub roles but five main kind of categories of roles that you could work in um, or that you could be recruiting um, maybe grab one or two you know grab one of them and go i'm just going to focus on um, this particular area of cybersecurity, and I'm going to just explore that really deeply. Um, and that's my last point there. Think about that inch wide, mile deep. Think about making sure that you know everything there is to know before you move on. Because I think we just kind of scratch the surface um, with, with mapping. We tend to sort of go, I've got a little bit of information, and then off I go. I'm, I'm running full steam ahead. Um, I'm not really de delving deep into it. So think about just narrowing it down to start with. It's just at the start till you build up your knowledge you're following your network and then start to expand from there in terms of um, trying to be an expert. Again, it's that kind of trying to be an expert to everything. Approach clients and say, I'm just working in this space. I'm working in cybersecurity. I'm an expert specifically here. It's a really powerful way to get their attention. 
Um, how some of this will be telling some of you, I guess, how to suck eggs to some extent, but you're looking at um, channels to that market. So who, who and how are people advertising to that market you're trying to get into? Um, you know, are they still a magazine based industry? Are they, um, you know, is there an association? Is there space where these people tend to look? Is there an annual conference? Those kind of things. So look at the channels to that market. Um, create a tailored marketing plan. Now, for most of you, you might not even have a marketing plan for your whole business, okay? Bad for you, bad on you. Um, don't do this if you're not going to create a marketing plan. Don't, don't try and forge into a new area if you're not going to sit down and plan out exactly how this is going to work. Um, otherwise, you're never going to get there, okay? Ask your existing clients uh, about how you're perceived in the market, what your reputation is so that you can make sure your positioning's right. Um, survey, as I said, you could, um, with candidates, you could survey organisations and clients. That also gets your name out there. So um, just because they got a survey from you and you haven't recruited one role in that space doesn't mean you can't be surveying that company to ask them information about um, what they do with their business, their strategic planning, what's going on after COVID, whatever it might be. So think about creating a, a survey that you can send out. And again, that kind of gives you a reason to connect with organisations in the space that you're trying to get into. Um, think about being a speaker or a thought leader. You know, this is better if you've got, again, a bit of a name and, and some traction in the space. Maybe not from cold, but who knows? If you're brave enough, go ahead. Um, think about trying to um, get into that space of being the thought leader, being the one that's sort of speaking out about it. And when I say speaker, again, think about video. I'm not talking about you trying to um, necessarily get the keynote speaker at their conference. I'm, talk about, I'm talking about you speaking about topics that they're interested in regularly. That makes you a speaker. Um, you build profile and then, yes, you can, you can get into conferences and the like from there. But think about being a speaker and thought leader in their space. Um, network, network, network. I don't have to tell um, good recruiters on this all. Um, that, uh, that's a really obvious one. But, you know, that's something that you need to have um, as an ingrained skill. I'm, I'm training a bunch of um, recruits at the moment, a bunch of uh, trainees, rookies going through my pathways program at the moment. Uh, and I'm teaching them how to network. I'm teaching them that subtle art. Um, of making connections, making genuine, authentic connections um, and, and being strategic about how you're going about that. So um, network, network, network. Maybe that's another whole session um, of itself. Um, and think about investing for the long term, um, both your time um, and money and budget. So again, I ask you to think about your why. I ask you to think about um, your real motivation for doing this because it's got to be long term. You've got to think about this, as I said, over a period of time, not just uh, you know something shiny over there i'm going to run over there while it's quiet in covid um to be perfectly honest wasting your time you're wasting your time you're, you're better off keeping in your lane um, and keeping on working on the market you've got because when it comes out of covid recovery you'll be in a better position chasing a shiny thing over there in the corner uh in this space without the commitment of long term you're really going to shoot yourself in the foot Sorry to be so blunt. Um, how are you going to go about it? Um, think about hiring an expert. That's an obvious one that a lot of us do. So who is another recruiter in the space, one of your competitors that already knows that industry, that already knows that market? So hire an expert in that space. But think about hiring somebody in the space who has no recruitment experience. And I know that seems painful for a lot of you. So a lot of you would say, oh, God, you know, that's, that's going to be really hard to do. But that person comes with all of the knowledge, all of the language, um, all of the industry information that you need to know to break into the door. You can just teach them to recruit. I can help you teach them to recruit. You know, you, that, that's the easier part. So think about the expert knowledge that you're buying uh, to hire an expert onto the team or maybe even as a subject matter expert. So maybe you could hire that person as a consultant to consult to your recruiters about what they need to know. Um, that's another way to gain that knowledge and that advice without having to pay for it at, at a high end. Um, career advice to contacts in the industry. So think about offering a service where you could be providing career advice to major clients, contacts in the industry you're trying to get into. So they may be um, wanting, yeah, any, any sort of career advice around what's going on in the market. So just likewise um, that a client um, wants to know it. I mean, that is a client, but you're doing it on a personal one-on-one. -on -one. So would you like to know what the average salary, you know, a lot of people do the salary surveys. Would you like to know what the average salary is for the position you're in? And they say, yeah, sure. And that opens up that conversation with them. So think about advice or what information you've got that you could entice the contacts to talk to you. Um, news and media, still a great way of getting your message out there. Again, think about your marketing um, 
plan and what's appropriate for your brand and your spend, but using news and media, writing news articles, trying to get published, trying to you know, do press releases can all form part of a marketing plan. Um, you could hold a focus group. That's a great way to connect um, with players at a very one-on-one -on -one, um, level. Obviously, hard to do at the moment uh, with social distancing, but um, you could do a, a virtual one and maybe people will be uh, more inclined to participate because it's not so confrontational. So a virtual um, focus group where you run a bunch of ideas or topics, um, you've got to share a bit of information in a focus group to attract them to come along um, and then you know, asking them a range of questions. It's, it's a real life um, survey um, when you have a focus group. Um, sponsoring or advertising, think about that. You know, there are events in, in the space and so think about um, where you need to be seen. Um, could you sponsor, can you advertise in those things? You could of course acquire a business. That's an aggressive way to get into a new market. There's a great um, player over there. I'm just going to gobble them up. Um, and if you've got the capacity to do that, that's an option. Um, I've looked at more organic ways, but that is an option there. And the last point I want to make here is about partnering or collaborating. Um, so making sure, um, you know, we think about the ways that we can work with others that would make it easier. And I think everyone would agree coming out of COVID, it's the one thing that we're probably all going to think about doing much better than we ever did. Um, if you haven't co collaborated already, if you haven't spoken to someone that you could work with to help each other's businesses now, you're probably never gonna do it. So get onto it now. People are craving that, that contact and information. They're open to ideas. People are open where they weren't before. They, they were closed off to thinking about these things. So think about wh who you could partner with and collaborate in our industry. As I said, this is a great network right here. So who on, on this line, who in this network, talk to Tony about that, um, could you partner with that is non-competing, but may be able to, you may be able to work really beautifully together um, to, to you know, extend your services and extend the offering. So if you haven't partnered or collaborated before the end of COVID, you know, that's my challenge to you out of this as well. So utilize this really unique time we've been in, in um, to get the best out of it. Um, the final slide around it is success factors. Um, you need to own the space before you do. Own it before you do own it. Act like you do, you know, the fake it to you make it. Um, you need to be really seen and really owning the space um, even well before you actually own it. So come out strong with, with your marketing and your strategy around that. Um, I'll be thinking about creating a budget that's years and not months. That's another mistake I see with a lot of business owners. They go, yeah, yeah, we want to get into this space and you've got six months to do it. And I just say, well, you know, you're going you're to scratch the surface in six months. If you're lucky, you might get a few roles here and there. You're not going to make a dent in an industry. If you want to get into a space and you really want to own it, you really want to grow your business in that direction, think about a long-term budget. Might only be small, but you've got to spread that out over months, uh, over years, not months. Um, regularly review and adjust. That's really critical because um, you don't want to get stubborn about saying, well, it was, you know, it's supposed to be a great industry. I've jumped in, I've set a budget, I'm going in for the long haul um, and then find, you know, maybe it's not the right idea for you. Maybe you didn't have the skills for it. Maybe it's all sucked up dry. Maybe it, it is, you know, maybe not, maybe you didn't do enough pre-research before you jumped in. So just regularly review and adjust. And I would say in the early stages, every month, every month to three months, we'll be reviewing and adjusting um, to keep, you know, focused in the direction, but make sure you're keeping on adjusting so you can do the long haul as well. Um, be a data analyst. Um, really critical that you don't just collect this data, that you actually use it and analyse it. Another big folly I see, we have all of this information, our consultants are collecting it, you're collecting it, um, you're feeding it back to your managers or you're talking about it at team meetings, nothing happens. Nothing happens from that data. It doesn't, you know, it maybe gets recorded, it doesn't really get analysed or sliced and diced. It doesn't get used in marketing. So, you know, um, Job Adder is um, a sponsor of Tony's programs for Captain Table. You know, they have um, great tools that you can actually sort this information in in the database. So get it in somewhere. If you're not using Job Adder, whatever your database is, use that. Use a spreadsheet if you have to, but collect, collate, and then analyse the data. Look at it like you would look at your P&L. We analyze our P&L or you analyze your budget figures, but really have a good look at this data that you're collecting about the market that you're wanting to work in. Um, consistency is key. We've spoken about that. It's really important that you do the activities that you're going to do in a plan repeatedly to get result. Um, and if at first you don't succeed, the normal saying is try and try again. Mine is ask why. 
So if at first you don't succeed, if you're trying to branch in, if you're trying to get that role, if you bid for some work in that space you're trying to get into and you don't get it, ask them why. It's a hard thing to do because it's confronting and we don't, sometimes don't really want to know why and sometimes we get the brush off answer. Oh, there was just others that, you know, were more competitive. Really ask why and level with the person and say, listen, I'm trying really hard to refocus my business here. It would be really helpful if I could have five minutes that would give me some really solid constructive criticism of where to direct my business. So if at first you don't succeed, definitely ask why. All right, and then the final part is just some maintenance. There's some websites there that I thought I'd share with you, which are some of the tools that I promised. If you're not using any of these or you haven't heard of these, check this out. As I said, it'll be on the presentation if you wish to access that from Tony. Um, Lusher, which is a great one uh, to be able to help you with connections on LinkedIn. Uplead, learn about. That's a way to find out information about people um, that's publicly available. Um, Zoom info um, is a great, it's nothing to do with Zoom, the video um, organisation. It's um, a, a company that will help you access people's information so client lists um, and Zapier is another one as well which has some of that great tooling and that's um, a link into to job adder for those of you on that so think about setting up what could be a really good mapping program and getting all of this knowledge about an industry and then my final bit of advice is could you sell this to a client could you create such a great market map about what's going on in a market, where the talent is, what the talent wants, understanding the market so intimately that that would become a valuable tool you could sell back to your client base. Great. Thanks very much, everybody. That's the end of my presentation. I'm here for some questions if you'd like or any comments. Thanks very much. I think I've got something in the right, chat. Thanks, Adele. Really good job. And um, we've got a few people.